welcome to 2022 once again. I mean, we're well, in, we're well into it now. We've got Rosiana here today. Hello. And we're doing a kind of a repeater of a video we did in 2017. Which is five years ago now. When we were about babies. Yeah. Where we picked books that we wanted to read in, in 2017. I think uh, I only read one of those and the rest of them I got rid of because I actually don't want to read them anymore. I read um, Homodeus that was on the list. I did quite well on, of the ones I read, yeah. but Homodeus was the one that sticks out because uh, there's a, a great picture of me that I think Sana took um, reading Homodeus in the pool. On holiday. On holiday, which yeah. is exactly, it's exactly my kind of holiday read. I like something chunky and, um, you know, just, just makes you think a lot, um, but Sana makes fun of me. <laughs> I will read Homodeus. One it's day. so good. I will. Um, I did love that, um, and I do kind of want to reread it. I also really loved his more recent book, uh, Twenty One Lessons for the Twenty First Century, which didn't get as much hype. But I no, it really some, didn't. It has, has yeah. some really salient points in it. So big fan. That's twenty seventeen. Uh, it's now twenty twenty two. We're moving on to the future. I wrote twenty twenty seven and the date the other day. <laughs> You're ready. You're ready I'm for ready. the new. <laughs> I'm like, let's get past the new this. era. And we're excited to read lots of books. We basically picked some of the ones we're most excited about for whatever. Whatever reason, we're going to share them. Maybe there's some in there that you want to read as well. Rosanna borrowed some of mine. To yeah, I didn't, bring, I didn't bring them over because I'm really lazy. <laughs> I'm always like, I have to have the physical books, but I'll put your yours like on screen. I know which one I want to start with because it's at the top. So yeah, I'm, I'm excited that. for you to start with that one. But this is like a shared one, except that Rosanna's already read it. This is what I brought on my holiday this time, actually. <laughs> Most recently. Classic. So, Two Paradise by Hanya Yanagihara who is the author of A Little Life, which I read as an audiobook, which was an extremely interesting choice. Yeah, how was it as an audiobook? Good. Yes. But sometimes I was listening to it out loud as I was cooking and my um, flatmate would come in and be like, what is this? What yeah. is this? I don't know if I, mm, maybe I would have read the whole thing as well if it was mm. physical. Uh, I am firmly in like the three star oh. area because I have some critiques but like the writing is beautiful. It's five stars to me. It's five stars. Yeah, yeah I, I love, love that. Yeah. But this is a oh. whole new world, a whole new topic. Um, and I actually went to my local bookshop on publication date and bought this. I fortunately had a five pound off voucher because if you hit like a certain amount, you get five pounds off. So that felt, That's that felt good. <laughs> you never buy books. But yeah, that, that was really nice. And they had it out at the front. And I, I don't do that very, I don't know if you do it a lot. I don't do it very often, but. I do it. <laughs> it, was, it was a nice little event. Should I give you a yes, brief Yes, please give the okay. pitch. So there are definitely a spoilerific elements that I won't mention, but um, it is in many ways speculative fiction, mm -hmm. and also there's a level of alternate history. It's told in three different timelines, that are like three different sections of the book, um, and there are themes of colonialism, of um, pandemic, so stay away if you want to stay away from pandemic books. Um, of uh, love and belonging and the opposite and inversion of that and it has a lot of connections to Hawaii as well and Hawaii in the, in the context of the USA and race in the conversation and it's really very bloody good and it starts with um, a map oh. of the US as well which probably wasn't in I your proof copy yeah. yes I had a proof copy of it so it says book one here but then yeah. I, I was looking if there were more maps and I haven't seen anything yet there Add must some... be more maps <laughs> So it's adding some context for you as oh, well. Oh, that would have been very helpful. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, book two and book three. Nice. Oh, yeah. This made really me nice. laugh so much. The author bio in the back is a single line. Amazing. That just says, Hanya Yanagihara lives in New York City. I love it. Full I love stop. That. I am a mysterious author. Well, she's like the editor-in-chief of a magazine. Like, she's got oh, her, her name out there. It's but very I love funny. it. It's very... And, and I like that she's not... It's very intentional. It's very intentional. Yeah. And the book is as well as Hawaii, it's a, a mainly set in New York City. You can feel when an author is like, I am writing a work of literary <laughs> fiction. And, and that is what I like to read. <laughs> but yeah, I got a proof of it and it was, and it's what I took on holiday. I literally couldn't put it down. Oh, and because nice. it's so heavy, yeah. my wrist got really sore. It got really tired. I think your like, review of it definitely was one of the, the reasons I picked up as well. So I'm very excited. We'll be reading it this year. 
I'm an influencer. All right, I'll start with a big one. Do not, not move the, the camera. camera. Do not, not move, move the camera. camera. So one of the books that I definitely want to read this year, and as, you know, I influenced you, I feel like I should follow with one where you influenced me, is a book that I refer to as Dutch book, but is actually called The Discovery of Heaven, which have you mentioned? You've already mentioned it on your channel, haven't you? I have, you? yes. Yeah. I did a whole video about uh, Dutch books in translation in English, so if you can't read Dutch, then you, you can read these. I'm really excited about this one because when Sana was telling me about it, it reminded me of a lot of the books that I have read and love, like His Dark Materials, especially The Amber Spyglass, um, and the Jorge Luis Borges uh, short stories as well. It's not quite magical realism, but it is this abstracted... Yeah, thought. there is something else, like looking yeah. down or like involves other powers are involved. And in this case it's angels. Yeah. I really like that, and that's the Dutch one. This is the Dutch version, which is significantly thicker. Like, I think about a thousand pages. Uh, I am not that far into it, but I have started reading it. Oh, the text um, is really small there. You have to tell me when you're reading it, yes! and then I will also continue to read it. Should we pick it for a book club and then make everyone else? <laughs> Can you imagine? I've read the 50 pages and it reads so quick. Like, yeah. I think I have really found last year, especially, anything that I picked up that I was a bit scared of. I was like, yeah. oh, what's going to be? It was all fine. Like all of it was so much easier to read than I thought. And I think you just build it up in your head. And there are of course a few books that are quite hard to read, but a lot of them are not, especially if they're popular. And I love a chunky book, but I'm really excited to read this. Mostly because I haven't read much Dutch fiction. This was chosen as the best piece of Dutch literature, I think like 10 years ago by the Dutch people. So we're starting easy. Yeah, <laughs> starting with number one. Okay, so my challenge for the year, if that other massive book both of those were in a big enough challenge. We're reading Anna Karenina. I'm reading Anna Karenina. A little known. <laughs> just this book, I don't know, I've heard about it once or twice before. You're gonna laugh when I tell the story, I just know it. I bought this in the Waterstones hardback, 50% off sale, and had a book voucher. So I only paid two pounds for this beautiful book. She says I'm gonna laugh because I've been teasing her about it, but yeah. that's the first thing that she says when she brings up the book to anyone. But in fairness, it is gorgeous. I haven't invested in any of the Clothbound classics before. I also know that they do like, the paint kind of wears off a little bit, so mm. I'm like hesitant to buy lots of them. But I thought for Anna Karenina, this is a, this is a good idea. I also read some samples of the different translations online, because there are three different translations, so you can kind of do a quiz that tells you which translation is the best match for you, just depending on which paragraph you like the most. I love the, the depth of commitment you did to your copy of Anna Karenina, like the research and the translation. You know when people like, they buy something new to like encourage them to like take up a hobby or to, yeah. to have a new habit? I feel like this was an event. Yeah. And because of that, I'm more likely to read it. I did a little calculation yesterday. I need to read 68 pages a month Okay. to finish this in a year, which you seems can totally, totally do reasonable. That. So far I've read like five. It starts off with a list of names and then all the Always a good song. all the like the five other names that each of the characters are called. <laughs> I have seen the film, but it was so long ago that Which I don't film really... did you see? The Karen Knightley one, of course. Oh, I haven't seen that. Uh, so I know tiny bits of what happens, but I know the ending. <laughs> you know the broad but, plot points. Yes. That's my challenge for the year. I love that. I will report back. Another book that I had many positive reviews about, and especially from this person right next to me, <laughs> is Luster by Raven Lilani, um, which, yeah, I haven't read, and was one that I expected to read myself last year, because it was just so everyone was talking about mm -hmm. it. You said what page turner it was as well, um, but the year just sort of got away from me, so this is one I'm excited to read, and is, uh, yeah, much, much hype. Have you read many of the, which I know is, was always popular, but especially popular now, the, like, women in their 20s don't know what they're doing, making questionable decisions yes. books. Yes, I have. I've definitely found, and also it's funny because as I was reading those kinds of books, I was like, oh, I'm reading a genre right now. Yeah. Like, you kind of keeps happening. And it also feels tightly connected in a way, or maybe it's just because I'm 30 now, to this bridge of other books, which is like women in their early 30s writing very essayist, memoirist type books. It's like, I'm like, oh, life, <laughs> I have lessons. <laughs> yeah, and then it's like, I have no idea what I'm doing. Yeah, it goes from this to like, the sort of like, very conscious chaos, but like, it's not, and then something goes wrong, and then they like, reflect on it. So I feel like it's a very, um, age appropriate read. The base rock. Do you want to say that with more conviction? <laughs> no. I believe in that. I also picked this up because of recommendations from friends, but also, on paper, this yes. is my type, you know? This yeah. is... 
historical set during three time periods. It's about women and their struggles. Uh, so it's set in early 1700s, after the Second World War, and then six decades after that. They're all connected by this place in Scotland, um, which I'm guessing is the base rock. This cover's all right. It is pretty. <laughs> I liked it at the time. I have the same copy and I know what you're about. <laughs> and then they have this beautiful new paperback, which I'll put on screen. Mm. Which every time I see it in the bookshop, I'm just like... Oh. It's so beautiful. Yeah. It's such a well done cover. I'm like, this is lovely too. Yeah. But I wish I had the other one. Anyway, this is one that I think is what Ariel calls a mashed potato book. You know you're going to love it, so you leave it to last. But yeah. it means you never read it because you're just like, well, I want to save this for like a moment or whatever. So I've got to read it. Go read it this year. That's, like, that's also on my TBR as well. I bought that. Yeah. I think I bought that um, during lockdown, first lockdown mm -hmm. or something. And I was like, yeah, I'm going to get so much reading done. Next, you might know I have this John Wyndham collection. These editions are absolutely beautiful. I love them. Uh, and all the John Wyndhams that I've read are from this collection as well. So I've read The Chrysalids and Day of the Triffids. Day of the Triffids is one of my favorite books. I have four more from this collection. So, so I'm going to have Rosanna pick which one <gasps> I'm going to read. A special <laughs> task. <laughs> okay. Please hold. I think this is going to be the one. This is the one. Uh, the Kraken Wakes. Or the Kraken Wakes? The Kraken Wakes. Yeah, I always say this word is Kraken. And I, it's one of those words that uh, is it's from my Spanish. English. Yeah, that I'm just like, it's always going to be Kraken in my mind. Okay, you're going to read this. Yes. And the, the blurb is, uh, it started with fireballs raining down from the sky and crashing into the ocean's depths. Then ships began sinking mysteriously and later sea tanks emerged from the deeps to claim people. For journalists Mike and Phyllis Watson, what at first appears to be a curiosity becomes a global calamity. Helpless, they watch as humanity struggles to survive now that water, one of the compounds upon which life depends, has turned against us. Finally, sea levels begin their inexorable rise, and the world looks set to drown. Sounds like, um, Pacific <laughs> <laughs> You love Pacific Rim. <laughs> Pacific Rim is my Christmas movie. Anyway. I'll read that. Yeah. But these are all, they all look They're fantastic. So beautiful. I think it's all speculative fiction. I don't know if that's like everything he's ever written, but I know there's a yeah. few more of these. I mean, this one's a collection of short stories as well, yeah. if you want to start with something so shorter. Yeah. <laughs> this is the classic bumbling English protagonist at the end of the world, which I love. That is I your favorite love. genre. It's just so different from the American protagonist. Everything's epic, and here everything's just like, oh no, yeah, it's funny, the world is it? ending. Yeah, it's always like an American, like ex-military or still in the military figure, uh, who's like got out to save his daughter, and here we're like, oh no, I'm a journalist. <laughs> Speaking of classics, here's a slightly older classic that I'll be reading this year. It's *The Mill on the Floss* by George Eliot, which I'm pretty sure I've pretended to read, to be fair, mm -hmm. several times before. I've, I've read part of it, and I've written either an essay question yeah. or like an exam question on it. I definitely know what happens in it as well. This is like you and Anna Karenina. I know what happens. But in school, in, in, in secondary school, I remember people being like, oh, you like books? Oh, well, you must have read Middlemarch and The Middle on the Floss and Thomas Hardy and all of this. And I was like, oh, it's that pressure when people come up to you and mm -hmm. it's what they've expected you to read or what they say you must have read. The pressure of the canon, as it were. Um, that I like really resented it and then just like avoided it, even though I know it's supposed to be absolutely tremendous. Um, I have an, a copy of The Mill and the Floss at home that um, I picked up during my Land's End to John O'Groat cycle. I think maybe when we were in Yorkshire. I think it was at the bookshop by... Cost. The Abbey. By the Abbey, yes. yeah, yeah. That they had the, a big sale and they also had these beautiful old folio editions as well. Um, so I picked up a copy of Mill on the Floss and this is going to be the year that I read it and I look forward to it. And it's really nice to be at an age where I'm like, I don't care about, you know, the books I pretended to read or not or the ones that I also felt like I was supposed to read because now I'm at a point where I'm such like an independent person. It's really fun, like, refinding the joy. And also, not because I think you read so many classics that you don't like when you study literature that you almost kind of start to think that you don't like classics but you forget that there's also lots of like wonderful classics that you'll love and it's easy to forget that those exist and so it's, it's nice kind of refinding that yeah I just don't like the pressure of people telling me what I should and shouldn't have read what's coming up next then? um <laughs> some interesting reading for pandemic times but we know we know what I'm like I'm gonna start with the most challenging one I guess. The Parable of the Talents by Octavia E. Butler. I've read The Parable of the Sower. It was to date the bleakest book I've ever read including 
A Little Life. So this was supposed to be a trilogy, ended up being only a duology because the author passed away. And this is set in a world where there is drought, there people are basically sort of on the move like on this nomadic lifestyle trying to find a way to survive and it's about a girl who lives in a small community that also has nothing but is in a walled community at least um all of that falls apart and then she ends up being on the road as well there are also some almost like magical elements to it in a way but yeah incredibly bleak lots of discussion about climate and humanity and i feel like this is one of those books that really explores what's the worst case scenario and what is also the worst way that people can respond to it and governments yeah. can respond to it there is some hope in it too uh but yeah i'm really curious to see what part two will bring i will say also like i'm gutted obviously like so many of the people that the third one was never written but the second one contains a lot of clues as to what the third one okay, so you can kind of fill it in in at least in my yeah. mind i fill it in then in an extremely similar theme a non-fiction book the uninhabitable earth which I'm so mad at myself that I haven't read this yet. I'm mad at you too, it's a really good book. It has this beautiful, well it has this like dead bee on the cover, which I think <laughs> is like, this is gorgeous design. Uh, this is about all the different scenarios that the world could end in, basically. Uh, and my boyfriend's read this as well and he can do the party trick of like naming all the different ways the world can end. I I know this isn't like a like solution based book, although you said that you've read this as well. There's yeah. some of it in there. Um, I just think it's really interesting. This feels like a very thoughtful yes. book, even though I haven't read it yet. Uh, that's fine. It came out in 2019 and I actually bought tickets for an event. Me too! <laughs> and then it got cancelled because of Covid, like yeah. at the very beginning of Covid. One that I am, I have out of the library actually and I haven't made loads of progress but I've read about 100 pages of so far is Capital by Thomas Piketty. It's a big chunky boy. I'll try, oh what a nice picture of it. Um, it came out, I think you say actually, Thomas Piketty. No, oh, really? <laughs> yeah, my lecturers have been saying that and I've just, every time like, they say it, I'm like, yeah. Who? Oh yeah, Thomas. Uh, but this is a, a book about basically capital and capitalism in the 21st century. Um, obviously Marx's famous book was Capital. Um, and I, know, I was like, I know very little about this. <laughs> it's uh, and it's just about kind of how the economy works, how inequality works, dynamics of power. Um, and it's, yeah, it's just really brilliantly written so far. I'm liking it a lot. There are definitely lots of uh, criticisms of it that have come about and I'm reading them and learning about them during my masters at the moment that I'm doing um, but it's uh, it's been great and it's funny because it's definitely a book that I didn't think I could read in a way mm -hmm. like it was a book that I previously had thought oh that's not for me that's for people who know things about economics and that's kind of how that's a big function of economics is to create this impression of something very scientific, very academic, very out of reach, and that's how it's maintained its power. Yeah, they don't even start to look into yeah. it because you feel like it's not for you. So really a neoliberal scam, and I'm coming for it, um, and I will be reading <laughs> Capital by Thomas Piketty. So you're just like, I'm reading this book <laughs> because reading they this don't book. want me to read no, it. <laughs> no, I feel like Thomas Piketty wants me to read this book. Okay. Yeah, but yeah. The, the greater world doesn't. Yeah. Um, and there are lots of like feminist, um, economist critiques of the new capital. My next nonfiction is Cult of Progress by David Olasoga, who also wrote Black and British, which Such I read book. two years ago. It was one of my favorite books of the year. Uh, I saw this in a bookshop and I didn't even know that this existed. Like I was looking for a book on a similar topic. So this is about museums and colonialism and like the items that are in museums. It's also about like cultural exchange and the idea of like progress mm. and what that means. It has Lots of pictures. It has pictures! It has lots of pictures as well. Um, this is just a topic that like I've listened to a podcast called Stuff the British Stole, which I think is incredible. We're both museum lovers and I think just in recent years I've become more aware of the conversation around museums, especially ones that are, you know, showcasing sort of like art from around the world and like items that uh, were, you know, <laughs> stolen. I just want to know more about it, basically. Yeah. I want to know more context. I want to know more about, you know, specific pieces of art, but just also just the wider conversation around it. Also, the last time I went to the British Museum, mm -hmm. I ran into two different demonstrations mm -hmm. and people who had like QR codes of like, please scan this and like take this away as further reading. And I've seen lots more about, um, there's currently like an app that you can use to do like the alternative tour of the British Museum. Hey, cool. Again, we get more information. So there's, there's more and more resources and more and more people being heard when they 
uh, talk about topics like this. So yeah, that's what I want. Brilliant. Read that one. This is going to be a big non-fiction year for me as well. So um, yeah, I'm doing a master's at the moment and it means I'm reading loads of non-fiction and I'm just trying to contextualise that and I've got a dissertation to write <laughs> um, in the next six months or so. Um, but one that I'm going to read that's a very kind of classic of Latin American studies is um, Open Veins of Latin America by Ed Eduardo Galeano, I think is his name. Um, I think it was written in the 70s or 80s and it was mm. one of the, oh, I, I might be getting this timeline completely wrong, so please write on screen if I am. No, I'm going to have to do some research. <laughs> no, no research, <laughs> just pretend I've said the right things if I haven't. Um, but about the kind of colonial history of the region and also the more recent history, it's definitely like a key text in the studies of, of um, Central, North and South America. Um, and I'm reading this great book right now called Empire's Workshop by Greg Grandin, which is about how the US practiced its um, colonial behaviors on Central and South America and Mexico before exporting them around the world. It's very good. It won a Pulitzer Prize. Oh, wow. Uh, which I always want to say Pulitzer, but I think you say Pulitzer. Very, very good. And I'm reading the expanded and updated edition, uh, which has even more recent context. Um, but yeah, that's just part of me wanting to learn about that region. And it's one that's been in my mind a lot because um, the author Isabel Allende, who I love, um, talks about that book a lot and, and especially its relation to where she's from, Chile, and um, the US's involvement there mm. as well. I still haven't read any of her books. Well, really this could be to. a good year for it. I need to, yeah. I will. I'll ask you which one to read. Good thing you got a birthday coming up. <laughs> <gasps> mm. I'm ending on a really fun one. Okay, great. Um, we need that. <laughs> Something a little different, fiction as well. Uh, the Girl in the Tower by Catherine Arden. So this is called the Winter Night Trilogy, I'm pretty Ooh. sure. Uh, and it starts with The Bear and the Nightingale, which I absolutely loved when I read it. It was, again, one of those that I was like, I knew it was gonna be totally up my street. And it was about a like teenage girl in a small Russian medieval village. In the town, yes. In the town they leave offerings to the spirits, the like house spirits, and she's the only one who can actually see them. They're actually real. And there is like an ancient curse. There's a priest that comes to town who is tempted. I was young temptress. As a teenager, I read so many historical novels about like rebellious teenage girls yes. who escape from their life, like that kind of thing. Anyway, it's a trilogy. I've only read the first one. I um, haven't read it, and you it. and Lex also talk about yeah. it. Yeah, I know, I just loved it. It just felt very robust and like magical, and I totally trusted it. I feel like this is very underrated. Like, I know people talk about it and people love it, but I would expect this to be even more popular, okay. basically. That's a good wintry read as well. Yeah, Russia. well, that's the problem. I always save it for winter and then I don't end up reading it. So uh, I just need to, whenever the mood strikes, I'm going to I hit myself in the face. Big 2020 ahead, but we're excited for it. We're 2020? Not... <laughs> Big 2022 ahead, but we're excited for it. We're not putting loads of pressure on ourselves, but these are books that we'd love to read. But that was yours as well. You're done. You yeah, I'm done. That was, that was just my encouraging yeah. statement. Okay, perfect. Go have a look at Rosianna's channel as well if you're not already subscribed. Some beautiful cycling travel yeah. videos. So, lots of cycling lately. Also a study break I took in the South Downs, so it was really nice. Oh yeah, that's lovely. So yeah, go have a look at that as well. Alright, thank you for watching. I'll see you soon.